Uh, welcome to the Graduate Institute of International Development Studies. I'm uh, Gilles Carbonnier, Professor of uh, Development Economics here, and I have the great pleasure and honor to welcome uh, Mr. Daniel Kaufman, the President and CEO of NRGI, the Natural Resource Governance Institute, uh, for this conference, which is entitled Natural Resources, Deterring Corruption and Improving Commodity Trading Transparency. Uh, we uh, have the, the chance to uh, welcome uh, and host uh, Daniel Kaufman, who is well known uh, not only uh, of uh, faculty members, but uh, many of our students in economics and political science, because Daniel Kaufman has been pioneering work with colleagues at uh, the World Bank, uh, developing indicators to monitor and measure the quality of governance of institutions and uh, to raise the issue of corruption as a major issue uh, when we look at uh, development. And uh, last year, with the NRGI, Daniel Kaufman has uh, come up with a very novel index, the Resource Governance Index, which uh, measures the quality of governance related to the extractive sector in more than 80 countries. And uh, he looked not only at the quality of governance in the developing world, but also in uh, industrialized countries. And uh, I have been looking at the, the executive summary and some of the major takeaways, and there are some non-trivial and quite uh, important findings that we will hear about later on. Uh, this event is organized here at the Graduate Institute with our Center on uh, conflict development and peace building, as well as with our e-journal, International Development Policy. But let me add that it is uh, co-organized and uh, sponsored by the Swiss Development and Cooperation Agency, uh, SDC. And uh, we have uh, the pleasure to have here uh, with us also Tatiana von Steiger, who is uh, the deputy head of the Global Cooperation Domain, uh, she has a very distinguished career in international cooperation and development, very recently as, as minister uh, at the Swiss mission uh, to the UN in New York. And uh, without further ado, I will give first the floor to uh, Tatiana von Steiger, and then we will hear uh, the, the lecture and the presentation by Danny Kaufman. After that, we will open the floor for a conversation with the participants. And the event is video streamed, so uh, welcome also to all of those who are with us virtually. So without further ado, please, uh, Tatiana, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> dear colleagues and guests, on behalf of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, SDC, I would like to give a warm welcome to uh, Daniel Kaufman. It's a great honor to have you here with us this evening. This event is dedicated to two closely linked co topics, deterring corruption on the one hand and improving commodity trading transparency on the other. But I would also like to seize the opportunity in my welcoming remarks in thanking Professor Gilles Carbonnier, who made it possible that we will have a chance to listen to Mr. Kaufman's thoughts, which will certainly be inspiring as well as I'm looking forward also to the discussion which has been um, organized thanks to you and the Graduates Institute. Let me start by looking a bit into what the world news has told us last, in the last couple of days. Why? Because it shows it's a proof of the timeliness of today's discussion. Two days ago, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Norway appeared in the news headings around the globe. 
including in several Swiss media. Let me quote some of those articles. Norway's government pension fund Global, Oslo, divested nine companies from its portfolio, including multinational companies. Norges Bank Investment Management, which runs the assets of 1.1 trillion US dollar sovereign wealth fund, said in a news release today, a Tuesday, that its Council of Ethics recommended GPFG, which is the pension fund, divest investments in these companies due to their involvement in nuclear weapons production. Also, four companies, Evergreen, Marine Corp, Taiwan, Korea Line Corporation, Precious Shipping, and Taurus and Thai agencies, were divested from the Sovereign Wealth Fund's portfolio because of severe env environmental damage and human rights violations. So much about the headings. What is the relation between this decision of the world's biggest pension fund and today's topic to deter corruption in commodity trading? As the Resource Governance Index states in its introduction, improved governance is directly linked to lifting people out of poverty. The institutions, rules and practices determining how company executives and government officials make decisions and engage and affect citizens, communities, and the environment they inhabit. Norway's pension fund itself is funded to a large extent through the revenues generated by the extraction of oil. The investment strategy that follows more and more ethical guidelines can be understood on one hand as acknowledgement of the responsibility this huge investor has. On the other hand, it sends a major signal to the world on the importance of good governance and the non-acceptance of certain business behavior, both on the side of industry and governments alike. Turning now to my own country, which is known as the worldwide leading commodity trading hub, Switzerland. Switzerland is aware of its particular situation, its role and particular responsibility it assumes in regards to effectively fighting corruption in the context of extractive industry activities and commodity trading. As such, a thorough reflection has taken place in the past years, including in regards to the role and mandate the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation is assuming. The agency I am representing. SDC's core mandate is poverty reduction. However, it has evolved in recent years and nowadays. We also address global issues such as climate change, food security, migration, health and water scarcity. The mandate also includes the task to inform and enrich the domestic debate and to promote scientific research. Traditionally, SDC has a comprehensive development vision beyond the mere delivery of technical aid on the ground. The search for more policy coherence for development, therefore, is a concern since more than 20 years. This is the broader context of the event tonight. At the same time, this framework has also guided our strategies and operations with regards to the most recent international and domestic debate on what is labeled the resource curse. In the domestic context, this debate has started around 2011-2012 and reached a first peak with the Swiss government's background report on commodities 2013. Already prior to this report, but also since then, we worked at three different but well-connected levels. We have programs with which we address certain aspects of the resource curse on the ground, particularly in West Africa, but also in Mongolia. In these programs, we often address governance issues, such as accountability, transparency and corruption, and issues to small artisanal mining and its formalization. The second major area includes analytical work and data collection at the global level. In this context, we have a number of partnerships with think tanks, the OECD, or the Swiss Nas National Research Foundation. 
Beyond this, we have ad hoc mandates with university and spe uh, or specialized non-governmental bodies on topics like taxation, illicit trade, corruption, and the more. The third area of action we pursue is the domestic area. We actively participate in public debates with events we organize or contributions to events and reflections on others. Very important, we also participate in decision-making processes within the government. The ambition in this context is to introduce in a consistent manner well-documented positions, information and data in interagency consultations. As you can recognize easily, we believe in informed debates and decisions. This vision and understanding of our role and also expli uh, explains why we host this event today. Together with a more technical workshop, which took place earlier today, we hope to make available top-level quality data and analysis to the Swiss domestic debate. They are the result, among others, of a partnership we have with the National Research, uh, Resource Governance Institute since 2015. This partnership includes a significant support to the Resource Governance Index, on which we will hear more about from Daniel Kaufmann. For us, this debate is all the more welcome since the government is currently elaborating a report on gold trading and related human rights challenges. Moreover, the Swiss government will submit by the end of 2018 an update to its 2013 report on commodities. At the international level, Switzerland made important commitments in order to curb corruption in the extractive industries and commodity trading sector. At the 2016 Anti-Corruption Summit in London, Switzerland committed, among other commitments, to explore the scope for a common global reporting standard and work with relevant stakeholders to build a common understanding and strengthen the evidence for transparency in this area. This event tonight is very much about strengthening evidence, building a common understanding and developing instruments to strengthen transparency as a means to curb corruption. I trust that we will have a very interesting presentation and I am looking forward to a lively debate with all of you. Thank you very much. Maybe can go to the first. Excuse me, I'll just restart the presentation. Thank you for your patience. Good afternoon, and may, maybe good morning and good evening uh, here in other places too. It is my pleasure to be there. And first and foremost, thank you very much to both the, the host, Professor Vilka Bernier, and also Tatiana and the whole SDC, the Swiss Development Corporation Agency, with whom we have collaborated for many 
uh, many years very fruitfully on all these issues. And it is my pleasure and honor to be with you here today. Um, without further ado, let me get into the presentation by, oops, um, sorry again. Okay. Um, All right, now we got it. Uh, just because we believe in the, the power of data, in evidence-based analysis, policy making, and, and advocacy, um, let's start with a, a broader, a bit of historical context. And this is using other indicators that have been associated with, with, with the past 20 years, the worldwide governance indicator, which are also an input to the RGI. I will get to that. In a, in a second. But to frame the, the discussion and the scale of the challenge in terms of governance in natural resources, the, the sobering aspect by looking very carefully at the data, now we're updating it to 2016 and soon to 2017, is that the, <clears throat> the world in general has not improved in terms of uh, governance. Um, and that's on average. Of course, there are some countries that have done better, others that have done worse, and then there's a middle. middle. Now, if one unpacks the world into dif different groups, the countries which are more dependent are rich in natural resources. Both tend to do significantly worse on average in terms of governance, the various governance dimensions than the non-resource rich countries. And very uh, troublingly, it has not only not improved over time, but there has been a slight deterioration on average, while the rest of the world has improved somewhat. And that's what basically depicted here, both the difference in levels and the difference in the, in the trend between the resource-rich average and the non-resource-rich average. And that's why we're here today, and that's why with, with the passion and with evidence base, we are so involved in this very difficult area of um, natural resources and how to ensure that at the end of the day, the citizens of the country uh, benefit. Fortunately, there is variance, and I come from Latin America, a country in Latin America, including mine, Chile, who have improved over time and show that, yes, it can, it can be done, and we'll get to that. Now, the question is, well, that's sobering, but does it matter? And the evidence shows, and we have done in the past much research, and other researchers, including here, have worked on this, and showing that governance matters, and matters enormously. What we call the 300% development dividend from improving governance and controlling corruption. Namely, an improvement in statistical sense by one standard deviation, which is basically not unrealistic. It's one-fifth from the worst to the best of the whole spectrum in the world. An improvement in rule of law, in controlling corruption, is associated and causally. It causes a threefold improvement in per capita income on average. Of course, it's pulling all the data over the long term. It takes a long time for these fruits to be reaped, but it matters enormously. This is for the whole world, OK? Then the question arises, well, maybe for oil-rich countries or for mining-rich countries it's different because as a substitute to good governance, the country at least has been, been lucky enough to have discovered a lot of oil. So maybe this doesn't apply for resource-rich country. Well, not so. If anything, that relationship as we see here, where we segment between extractive intensive countries and other countries, it's even more sharply um, um, uh, rising when one basically has a combination of good governance and natural resources. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen as a rule. And there have been many countries who 
who have been facing significant governance uh, uh, challenges. This doesn't just apply to an impact in per capita income, which is one socioeconomic indicator, which I just showed, the 300% in improvement in income. So it's a country that today has $10,000 per capita per income in the long term. And it can take a long time. It can get to 30,000, thanks to improvement in governance. I have seen it in my lifetime in my country, in, in Chile, obviously. Um, some countries in Asia show also the, the, the way and, and a number of others. Um, but it's not only about income. It's also about investments, about productivity, the relationship between improving governance and corruption in particular we're showing here and improving the competitiveness of country and given the closeness here to the World Economic Forum um, <clears throat> headquarters, which produces the Global Competitiveness Index, uh, we can see that that matters for that. It matters enormously for, for investors. Uh, basically, the, the premium that a country has to give in issuing bonds and for in investors, the premium that that's expected is enormously higher. It's, we call it a 1,000 1, basis point difference if the country is misgoverned, has poor governance, versus a country that is well uh, governed. And all that basically type, type of work is an antecedent of, antecedent of the need that we thought that we needed to drill down and go into the area of natural resources and try to measure and have, therefore, an index of the specifics of governance in, in particular regarding the transparency and accountability in the in natural resource sector. And this is that study that you have outside, and it's here with enormous amount of data. It's everything, 10,000 documents, millions of data points are all in, in the web consistency with transparency it was a very elaborated and a medium term years in the making of a project process as it usually takes. I'm not going to bore you with all the steps, but this is a slide to say, trust us, we went through all the different motion preparing, hundreds of researchers involved from throughout, throughout the world and our, our staff expert staff with also with me here deployed in, into the, these. And as a result, we, we are assessing basically 81 countries, 89 different assessments, because in the case of eight countries, we assess both the oil and gas sector as well as the mining sector. And it, the overall coverage is the vast majority, basically, of production from around the world, thanks to these 81 countries. So we don't uh, <coughs> measure every country in the world, but the most relevant ones cover, covering, as we see, the lion's share, whether it's oil, gas, and copper, but also a non-trivial amount regarding other my, uh, minerals, such as, as gold, which is relevant here in Switzerland in, in particular. In a nutshell, in terms of the, the results, the bottom line result is quite sobering, again, not unlike the insights from the broader national governance indicators, but this is now we're talking about natural resources and extractive, where there are only four countries, <clears throat> Norway, Chile, the UK, and Canada, which are top performance in the good category, not yet a perfect, nobody is perfect, and there is room for improvement in all these countries. And then there is <coughs> a, 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 the next set of about 12 countries which are performing satisfactorily, and the rest is below satisfactory, whether it is weak, poor, or failing governance, as we see here. So it's about 85% of the countries that we have assessed in depth and surveyed in this are not performing satisfactory or below 
or well below as, as we see here. So it's, it's an enormous challenge. The good news is that there is a set of countries that is, is performing satisfactorily or even, even better. And it shows that yes, it can be done. There is no such thing as a predetermined resource course, first. And second, those countries that are performing are quite dispersed, not only geographically, but also in terms of stages of development and, and income. So there are a number of emerging economies that are doing fine, including, I'm um, biased, my own Chile, which <laughs> rates second. But there are a number of others in Latin America, quite a few, Colombia and others, and also in Africa, country, uh, countries like Ghana and <clears throat> in Burkina Faso and Mali that are, are uh, getting there. And of course, in some countries, it depends whether it's in mining or oil. Some are doing a bit better in one rather than the other. Keep in mind that in eight countries, we assess the, uh, both. There are some very high income and rich countries also that are not doing well at all regarding these transparency and accountability measures like Qatar. The Gulf countries in general don't perform very well for, uh, for known, known reasons. Um, this is the same slide again. Why the arrows? The arrows is just to highlight, because I, very important for me, the relevance of the audience here in, in Switzerland um, is to highlight the red countries are the countries of focus for Switzerland, which I took from the S SDC, your set of countries that are of focus. It's just to get a sense of where are they here. And obviously, like the whole sample, they're all over the place, they're well dispersed. And the yellow, because it's yellow, there are countries which are relevant in terms of gold mining, which also might be of interest of some in, in the audience and in general. Again, they are uh, quite, quite dis dispersed. Um, so, here we see a map of, uh, of the, the world in terms of these, these countries that we measure. If it looks a little bit like a copy and paste from the web, it is. And this is all, all uh, out there. One of the um, significant insights from this data is that it's not appropriate to generalize about whole continents. And that applies also generally in, in terms of governance and other, other factors. Within even neighboring countries, you can have vastly different performance with very similar historical antecedents. Take Latin America, the same type of historical antecedent and the difference between Venezuela and Colombia. For instance, it's, it's quite uh, startling between Chile and some of the, the neighbors. That similarly also applies in Africa. We do see that there are many countries that face very significant challenges, but we have the whole palette, the whole spectrum between good performance, relatively good, and failing countries. In case you're wondering why some countries <coughs> ha have these checkered colors, with two colors in a checkered fashion, is because they were subject to a dual assessment of both oil and gas on the one, side, on the one hand, and mining. So it depends on which one would, would look. Like Ghana, where you see the green and the yellow, um, in terms of, interesting enough, oil assessment came out ahead, and it was in the green category, good performance, versus the, the or not, not good, but satisfactory, sorry, versus the yellow that was just slightly be below, which was mining because of the legacy of the past. While some lessons were learned, oil is more recent, and therefore progress was being, being made. Now, too often, too much focus when an index is created is what we call is looking at the horse races and whether I beat my neighboring country by a nose or not. First, that's not very meaningful. We have to keep in mind that in all these efforts, no matter how much research and work is done, there's always a margin of error. There's an element of, of judgment that goes into the analysis and, and so on. So very small differences uh, 
<clears throat> between countries in terms of the scores are not statistically mean meaningful. In fact, we call it a statistical tie, and that is one of the reasons that we do the coloring rather than showing as a precise uh, ranking. So we are confident that about the data to say that a country can fall into a particular category, general category of well-performing or being failing or not, but one or not over-interpret the exact precise number. Second, it's so important to go beyond the number and to drill down to the very specifics of what are we talking about when we talk about natural resource uh, governance and to be useful and work with the countries for improvement to see, okay, what are the key areas that where the country is doing fine versus not fine. And so the index with that in mind was created having three key components. One is the value realization component, which is essentially the uh, <clears throat> upstream in terms of the, the uh, value and decision-making chain process and figuring out, and that's where the subcomponents um, come in, the figure out the, the laws and the transparency and accountability regarding the licensing system, the taxation, the lo local in impact, and how the state-owned enterprises are, are doing. Then the second key component also within the nat natural resource sector, the extractive sector, is to assess how revenue management is taking place. And that has its subcomponent in, term, in terms of the national budgeting, in, <clears throat> in terms of the subnational resources, and sovereign wealth funds, which you mentioned also about Norway, are assessed um, in, in some detail as, as well. And the third, and rather different, but absolutely key component is the overall enabling environment within the country. So one can have in the laws the right type of things in the extractive sector, but if there is an enormous corruption in the country, or if civil society is not able to operate, and there's a lot of repression in terms of civic space and civil liberties and so on, then there cannot be effectively a translation of these laws into effective accountability. So how rule of law and all these others work, and for that, the worldwide governance indicators are used as an in input as well as open data indices that we drew upon. Those are drawn from external indicators, while the first two components that I just mentioned, which is focus on the extractive, are drawn from our own research via the, the 150 or so researchers from around the world that we use. To give it more life, these this is an example, and that's when it starts really mattering and being useful at the country level. So this is just for one country, which I know is relevant here, also Mali. Um, and, and it shows, again, the whole structure of the index, <clears throat> starting at the, at the very top, the composite, the overall score being 53 out of a maximum possible of, of uh, one, 100. Um, and, but then one has to drill, drill down. So in terms of revenue management, very interestingly, it's doing much, much better on those areas. And in fact, it's in the green category, scoring a 70 versus value realization, where it has much more of a challenge, as well as the enabling environment, which is much lower. And then one drills down even further, and one sees significant amounts of progress in the greens versus where the reds are. So it serves as a diagnostic instrument to work within the country, and that's why many NGOs, think tanks, parliamentarians, uh, and some also in, in the government themselves become very interested and say, okay, what, where should we focus? It helps us also and others strategize where to have interve interventions. Um, that's a different country, in the case of Colombia, very different country. You saw right away, I go back and I go forth the greens and the reds, how they, they change her around. And Colombia, of course, it's performing overall a little bit better, but also with significant variance and different challenges. 
Tanzania, the, before was mining, I show mining for both Mali and, and Colombia, now Tanzania has both, but I'm showing the, the oil, oil and gas. So this is to give some sense. In addition, the, in the index, we assess <coughs> what's happening and what um, uh, extent of, of progress and effectiveness is, is there in adopting key laws, policies, and regulations for the sector. That's the legal framework. And we get to an average score of 54, as well as we're assessing what's happening with the implementation of these norms that are adopted. And interestingly enough, we find an implementation gap, which is not very surprising, but it can be quite stark, which is significantly lower. So in practice, what's happening on the ground after being seen, not only what's adopted in the law, but it's, it's, it's lower. And it so happens that that gap, that implementation gap between law and practice is very significant, much larger for countries that overall are not performing uh, well. And that's, so those that are overall are not performing well, they may be adopting some policies, but a real hard trouble they're having, hard time in terms of implementation. And we find, in fact, that that implementation gap is, and we run some assessments, one of the most important correlates with an implementation gap is uh, corruption. Control. Can, countries that are more effective in controlling corruption have a much lower gap or deficit in terms of implementing the laws that they, they adopt, which is not very surprising, but it's very much in the, in the data. Essentially, informality rules in many of those countries, and the laws can be in the, in the books, but if there's a lot of corruption, then effective implementation does, does not take uh, a, a, a place. I had shown already, so I'll go very quickly through it, but this is to show again the, the vast array of countries if one wants to focus on the countries of focus for, for, for Switzerland. This is a subsample of, of, of those, um, or if one wants to fo focus on the ranking and on, on the assessment for gold mining uh, uh, countries where there are three, uh, 13 countries where there is the significant gold and those assessments are relevant as, uh, as well. Um, we do find in general, in terms of gold mining intensive countries, that the performance again is far from, from stellar and we see that in, in this uh, coloring. There's much more detail that can be gathered. This is the first set of countries with a, a satisfactory as well as the weak performance in, in yellow and then the poor uh, performers and failing performers, which we see there are quite a few with countries that are relevant gold mining. So there is a significant challenge there, but as we saw earlier, that also applies uh, to other countries as well. Other insights, very important for in the context of the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, whereby now there are <clears throat> just above 50 countries that are members of EITI, and uh, we are all already using all this, this tool and this major data set within EITI. I mean, the international board um, of that and my my colleagues are very involved with EITI implementation, so that's very useful in that, in that context. And we see again that there's a vast variety of how the EITI members, 44 of the 51 countries are, are assessed in our index. If, we, if this picture looks okay, these colors are looking a bit better than the ones that you presented before, it's only because here I couldn't fit 44, but only the first 25. So it stops with the yellow category, which is the weak performer. Eh, sorry, yeah, the, the weaker performer, as well as the satisfactory and the, and the very good. 
but then we do have those additional ones that get us to the to the 44, which are struggling more significantly. So we do see the extent of the var variation, and that's important for EITI. Overall, we do find that countries that are in EITI are doing a bit better than countries that have not joined EITI in terms of the, um, uh, the RGI in general, and in terms of two of the three components in particular, particularly regarding the components on a, in the extractive sector on natural resources, the value realization component I mentioned, the, and the second, the revenue management, which are the focus of EITI. There's little than EITI can do about the broader enabling environment, and that's where they still uh, that challenge has to be taken up much more broadly and within the, the nation in, in general and cannot be done by one sectoral initiative yet. That aspect is very important as well. This is, comes from the report again itself, and I'm not going to belabor, but it's again to showcase that <clears throat> we go into the specifics and assess key state-owned enterprises um, through, throughout the world, scores, scores of them in the countries that we, um, that we did the analysis where there are state-owned enterprises. And again, we see a very significant variety of one. Some state-owned some state enterprises, at least regarding these governance, transparency, and accountability dimensions that we go into it, are doing quite well, and they show that just being state-owned enterprise doesn't mean that they have to perform poorly. The ones from Chile, India, Argentina, of course, Norway, we know, uh, but then a number of others in emerging economies, including Indonesia and mining, <coughs> and uh, uh, Ukraine, Ghana, were doing uh, okay, very much in contrast of what's happening in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, and uh, Ethiopia and a number of other countries which are on the other extreme. That's all in the report. The same applies, I'm not going to show for the sake of time, uh, to sovereign wealth funds, which are also, is also showcased very, very much. Now, these, in general, there are many state-owned enterprises with enormous challenges. We just uh, saw that here. Uh, but then within state of our enterprises, the most opaque, the most challenged area um, is commodity sales. And, and that's very important for uh, what we're here today, where uh, Switzerland can play a very useful uh, role in the future. And we see that um, in, in here regarding the rules about commodity sales, how they are, they are governed and they're basically specified um, the performance is, is rather poor in general, but there are a few that do well. But once it comes even to implementation in terms of disclosures, they are very, very poor. I'll, I'll get back to that with some detail because <clears throat> there is a new report just released today uh, done by our organization and our key authors are here with us, also ready to to respond to, to questions. But let me first put the broader framework here in terms of the payment transparency laws, because that's very important also for, for Switzerland nowadays. It all started with the Dodd-Frank 1504 in US, <clears throat> with already six years ago in the law to mandate <clears throat> disclosure, full disclosure of the payments that a companies made to govern, governments around the world, particularly the companies in oil, gas, and, and mining. Um, now, they say the rule that was then subsequently issued was vacated once a new Trump administration came in and the Republican Congress. So basically there has been no progress there and the future is uncertain in regarding the United States. In the meantime, much happened in the 
in the European Union through the Accounting and Transparency Directives, which were passed already in 2013. In fact, in the dot Frank started already in 20, 2010, but then it has not been implemented as, as we know. While in the European Union, this is under full implementation and it's already um, covering about 150 companies. Then the Norwegians, which are not part of the EU, but are followed with something is, is similar, going a bit further even in terms of some dis disclosures. Canada then has also follow Follows, uh, follows suit. And then there is a question of how the next stage is going to happen in terms of going global. Australia is working on that. Switzerland, as we know, is working on a draft, will be in committee by the ne by next uh, month. And there is a possibility within the BRICS and others to continue. So this is a train that has departed with a few detours and stops and halt, but it's an in incredibly important initiative on the mandatory payments to governments, PTG, the di di dimension. And to, to gather all the information that is already, that data that is very rich and is coming out, thanks to those disclosures that have are already being implemented, particularly from the European Union, now soon, Canada, we have this initiative with this rp.org or resourceprojects.org where you can find enormous amount of information. If there are questions about it, then uh, my colleagues here who have been behind this can discuss that more. And we are talking about hundreds of billions worth of, of payments that are being put on this repository, this data set of over 500 uh, companies. One of the key findings using this data and putting all this data that, <coughs> uh, that my colleagues uh, Joe Williams and Alex Malden were here with me and this is a report that you saw outside. It's today launch and it's also on the web for anybody who is watching the webcast is that major payments are being made in kind in the form of oil, gas or minerals so when the company has to pay what they need to pay in royalties and, and taxes, a lot is being given in, uh, in, 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 in kind. And that has major implications then because that has to be then uh, used by the state-owned enterprise who is the recipient of that oil or mining. And where does it go? How is it used? And if it's sold, which usually it is, but for how much and under what terms? And that's where the commodity traders come in. And that has been a major pending area of opacity in this, uh, this uh, space. The report shows that the scale of these in-kind pay payments are enormous. Just one company, which is here based in in, in Geneva, not very far from here. Trafigura, who voluntarily, they decided to go ahead of the pack and disclose in spite of the general opacity in the sector, and in spite that it's not yet mandated by the, the law. 20, 2016, they disclosed a, a total of about $21 billion um, in, 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 in terms of their own commodity trading. Um, while, um, while Shell, um, in terms of the disclosures that they have made within EITI and so on, as mandated by the European uh, Union directives, because they are listed in the London Stock Exchange, they have only disclosed about 15 billion in, because they're disclosing what they, they basically pay for taxes and, and so on. So we're talking about enormous orders of magnitude of the commodity traders that are involved in this that are not fully, fully there. Sorry that this slide got a bit out of sync, but it's to go back to the in-kind payments that are so relevant as found in this report. And it was a surprise even to my expert analyst, the extent to which this in-kind payments was important. Unfortunately, these in-kind payments are particularly prevalent in countries with poorly performing state-owned enterprises. 
So a lot of in-kind payments are deals that with the state-owned enterprises that end up there. What this graph shows essentially is that um, almost about 85% of these in-kind payments end up in state-owned enterprises that are performing um, rather poorly and <coughs> um, or, or at least weakly, poorly, or failing. And only the two greens, which is a very small percentage, that's where it's ending up with ones that are performing well. So it's an area that requires definitely scrutiny. It requires disclosure to be able to see what's really happening with those. There are a number um, of, of details that are in very much in this report regarding the, um, the, the discussion of the commodity trading corruption risk and the extent to which there are many failures in terms of performance of that by, in terms of the na national oil uh, company, SOE's governance, uh, selection of buyers, buyers' disclosure in terms of the sales price and so on. And there are some differences on one, one area where it's performing not too poorly, but overall, and this all, is all analysis with the RGI done um, and this data showing the extent of the challenge regarding this commodity trading co risk, which are basically very much associated with corruption uh, by looking at these state-owned enterprises <coughs> which receive so much of these in-kind pay payments, which are still very um, o o opaque. Let me end now so we get into the discussion session with some of the recommendations. First, the broader recommendations that come out from the overall RGI analysis, the index analysis, and then specifically from the paper um, results and analysis with this data, but with the, also the new data on the re revenues of the sale of oil and gas that <coughs> Joe and Alex have put together. So in terms of the resource governance index recommendations, at the very basic level, six major areas of focus. First is to focus in addressing the implementation gap, which we did discuss. It's hard work. It's sometimes boring, it's difficult also for researchers, but at the end of the day, to get things done is very important. So it's not just adoption of um, laws and policies in many of these emerging countries that we work with. Second is continue the push for openness, for transparency, and on these multiple areas that we have discussed, not only about payments, not only about contracts, about beneficiary ownership, but also about commodity sales, commodity traders, and related to the in-kind payments we discussed as well. And related to that, to a bolster the governance of state-owned enterprises, which is a major area of focus and challenge and something that we are going to be working much more on, including with the ITI. Fourth is the whole challenge with civic space and also with combating corruption. Um, one of the findings I did not highlight with the other graphs for the sake of, of time, but let me say it now, is countries that have poor performance in terms of voice and democratic accountability with a lot of uh, challenges in terms of civil liberties, freedom of the press, freedom of association, and so on do not do well even on the technical aspects in terms of natural resource governance. So those go hand in hand. And uh, <clears throat> Tatiana earlier ref referred to the commitment to human rights. Those issues, human rights, civil liberties, and, and so on, also matter not only as a goal in itself, but as a way of empowering civil society, empowering the people to make governments accountable, and as a result, to improve also economic performance, competitiveness, and efficiency. 
The same applies to corruption. We already discussed that. So to address and take seriously and frankly the challenge of corruption, which varies from country to country, and ca some countries have that challenge much more than others. Strengthening the global norms uh, and institutions, and that regarding basically where do we go in the next stage with uh, global institutions such as EITI. Um, it's very important. It's an initiative that has been progressing, and the standard has evolved significantly. It's much stronger than it used to be. At the same time, there are political challenges that we should be very well aware of. The United States just withdrew from being an implementing country for their own political reasons and given the political climate in, in, in the United States. But a few days later, a country like Mexico joins the initiative, and now Argentina has said that they will join, and many other countries are showing that, yes, that they want to do more, so this, uh, this is also a very important aspect. But it's also very important in that context uh, of the global framework is the responsibility of the companies, of the international oil and, and mining companies, um, to do more to help improve governance in the sector. And six, last but not least, in terms of the general recommendations, is to go even further in using data and the power of data, uh, both as a research tool, but also as a policy analysis and policy advocacy tool, evidence-based policy uh, analysis and advocacy. And I, I know I hear uh, you work so much with data, so it's to encourage all these resources, where there are many tools in the web to use the data in different ways, including a very interactive, basically, user tool with a whole data set, um, and all the researchers, the students, academics are very encouraged, basically, to use that. Let me finish, since we are, after all, in Geneva, and it's so relevant to this political moment and to the country here, with the trading transparency, one more time. In sum, the challenge there is this major finding of the new report that I just mentioned, that the sale of oil gas can be the country's largest revenue stream. And the new data on in-kind oil and gas reinforces these. And second, those go most often to countries and state-owned enterprises that exhibit poor governance on the sale of those commodities. And there are, there are significant corruption risks associated with that. Um, now, I just mentioned it earlier, there's only one company that proactively and unilaterally are making disclosures without being mandated to do so, and that's Trafigura. Many other key companies are not doing so. So as a result, it should not be any surprise, but it just follows that um, one of the key <coughs> implications of that, that the commodity trading hubs should include commodity trading transactions in the mandatory requirement uh, uh, laws regarding payments to governments, the PTG, the payment to government laws. Obviously, Switzerland is the major hub, as well as the UK, and then uh, come a, a few, few others. So for a country like Switzerland, as the world's largest <coughs> trading hub, has a very particular, unique opportunity now regarding its own law that is currently being debated in Parliament to take that opportunity, because this is the elephant in the room here. What matters for Switzerland are not the regular uh, extractive payments or royalties, because there are less than a handful of relevant companies on that. What matters here is obviously um, on commodity trading. Um, so that's absolutely key, and let me then finish with that that point, and I look forward very much to the discussion that follows, and my colleagues are here to also answer specific questions on the details on this new study for which I just 
gave very little superficial um, introduction given the time frame. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Danny, for this uh, succinct and yet comprehensive uh, presentation of this new index, the Resource Governance Index, and also for, for the very um, specific and clear recommendations, uh, both globally and uh, more uh, locally. And uh, uh, out of the six recommendations that you have been given, uh, I can see that they involve a whole range of different stakeholders. Uh, for us in academia, obviously, the sixth recommendation, make use of data to push the analysis and understand the causality between so much variations. For instance, understand why, which came to me as a surprise, uh, when we look at the quality of governance with regard to state-owned enterprises involved in the extractive sector, we see uh, Argentina, India, Chile ahead of Statoil. I mean, this is uh, quite amazing. And then we see other uh, state-owned companies definitely at the end of the, the bottom of the list. And I think trying to understand what are the ingredients, uh, what are the historical factors, what are the institutional dynamics that led to this uh, would be uh, would be extremely interesting, and I'm sure that it will inspire a whole generation of, of young, uh, less young researchers to to empower themselves of the data. But indeed, I think uh, your recommendations uh, involve also state actors, uh, of course, the executive, but also how checks on the executive is exerted by others, including uh, the legislative parliaments, uh, political parties, uh, the judiciary. And of course, you mentioned it's civil society writ large, uh, civil society organizations and, and the private sector. So a very rich uh, agenda actually, uh, both for research but also a very rich policy agenda. And I'm sure that this will, uh, uh, this will inspire us uh, in, for the forthcoming conversation. So I propose to take a range of uh, two, three first questions and, and comments. And uh, I invite you to raise your hands, maybe just briefly mention who you are, and, uh, and then uh, raise your question. So please, uh, you have the floor, and we have someone here with a mic who can uh, give you the floor. Who would like to start? Be sure to speak in the microphone. Thanks, thanks, Danny, for a fantastic presentation. My name's Caroline Kendi-Rab. I'm the former executive director of the Africa Progress Panel. So we've actually worked together <laughs> quite a lot. Um, I just, I have a, a concern really about the, about the Dodd-Frank Act. And um, I just wanted to seek your opinion on it. First of all, do you think it really will be repealed? Um, if it's repealed, what kind of impact do you think that will have, and what can we do about it to try and stop this um, repealing going forward? Thank you. So if you agree, you take note of the question and we go for a second and maybe even a third question. Tatiana uh, Fonsai. This question is not easy to answer. <laughs> so maybe my question is easier to answer. In your recommendations, the six, rec six recommendations you listed, um, the f I, I have a question to the fifth, and um, specifically in regards to Trafigura and, this, and the relation to, or the, the correlation with civic engagement. Is there any, well, first of all, what motivated Trafigura to disclose their figures? And are there any examples of civic engagement in those countries that then, oh, where basically the money was flowing to the government and disclosed, which um, show that the, the data which then was made available thanks to this disclosure 
was used for uh, by civil society to engage with the government in terms of the allocation of the resources they generated through these, uh, the money that was um, received by, uh, by the government um, in, uh, from, from Trafigura. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman, for a wonderful uh, presentation. I had a question about um, your, uh, to, uh, I would like to know your opinion about um, a lot of uh, multinational international policy initiatives uh, concerning uh, things like uh, the base erosion and profit shifting initiative, the financial action task force, the automatic uh, exchange of financial information. Uh, how would you contrast these international policy initiatives versus the national uh, re uh, legislative reforms that you we uh, spoke about a little bit today in terms of uh, uh, publishing what you pay and uh, the EITI transparency initiative, for example. So because uh, the context for my question comes from, there seems to be uh, ever since the global financial crisis and the focus on financing for development, financing the sustainable development goals, there's been quite a lot of focus on domestic resource mobilization in uh, developing countries, uh, which has led to the uh, discussion of a lot of these policy initiatives. So it would be really nice to get your uh, overview on how would you contrast these international initiatives uh, versus the more national legislative reform that can be done. Thank you very much. Well, and um, we have until midnight. <laughs> um, you know, it's... It, the difficult position one is put by being up here in the panel is the presumption is that one has the answers to, to excellent question. The three of you, and I know your fantastic work that you have done, Caroline, have been working on these issues and thinking about that for a long time. So let's not presume that, that uh, uh, these will be full answers, but let me just give some reactions not to use what I just said as a way of not uh, saying much about, about this, because these are such important issues. Um, just dot Frank, first, first of all, just for everybody being on the same page, we're talking about a very particular section of the dot Frank Finance Reform Act that uh, comes from the Obama era in the aftermath of the financial crisis, where there was a, a couple of very particular sections that were not about financial sector reform, and that's section 1502, which is on on, a, on a basically a, the source minerals, particularly for DRC, that it has been relevant also in Switzerland, but the one we're talking about is section 1504, which is a Luger carding provision, which was the, the start of the PTG the payments to government mandating that that oil mining and oil gas and mining companies have to uh, fully disclose. So that was adopted and was the first country to adopt it. They took the lead on, uh, on that and that was subject to a major challenge through the court by the American Petroleum Institute, which is the lobby arm of, of big oil in the United States, particularly uh, Chevron and Exxon uh, be behind it and it was constantly challenged. It went back and forth and it was about to start implementation in at the end of the previous um, <coughs> administration. The new administration comes in and uses a very obscure provision, not only to stop that, but to vacate the law by an act of Congress, where very, by a, a very small margin they manage to uh, to use that provision. Vacating meaning that it has to go back to the drawing board and it has to be reissued, the regulation according to the SEC, not the whole law the regulation, but it has to be substantially or materially different than the previous one, whatever that interpretation is. That's supposed, I mean, the agenda for this happening now early 
in 2018 is nowhere there to, to be seen, although sometimes surprises happened in the very near term. And in parallel, a few months ago, a um, couple of months ago, an initiative in Congress led by the same uh, congressman that started the, the vacating type of approach is and a new initiative started to try to repeal the whole law. And your question goes to, uh, to that. It's uh, obviously, it's impossible to tell what will happen. It came out, it was voted in committee, so it can go to the whole house. If it goes to the whole house of Congress, which is the lower house in the United States, it's likely to be adopted. But then it's not for sure at all that it would pass in the Senate because of the very tight um, uh, tight alignments. Uh, all Democrats would vote against it, and there may be a chance that some Republicans even say that uh, it, it's not enough. So what we, one can do about it is anybody who can pass on that, that information and con contacts, particularly with the Republicans, member of, of the of the Senate against that likelihood. At the same time, let's be realistic. Whatever happens, there may be even more challenges. So it's not as if implementation of this in the United States is imminent. So, and this is very important regarding what we're all doing in this context because the moment that this happened last year with the rule being vacated in the US, we changed approach and said, let's go to, to this global initiative, which was also part of, 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 of your question, like EITI, and we got a, a much more increased commitment from all stakeholders in EITI, in spite of the previous, um, the previous opposition, to detail payment by payment disclosure, and that is now a requirement that has to start being implemented within the, uh, the, the, the next year for the 50 uh, plus countries. So to, and that was very interesting, the extent to which many of the governments and the countries said, yes, we, they did not embrace what was happening in the United States, they said it's time to move forward for that. So to work with also the emerging economies and the countries say, this is very important to us, and the countries adopting their own regulations and laws and saying, if you, international company, are going to operate in our country, you have to disclose. Ultimately, even the actions of the children of this world follow the law. So if at the country level that's being adopted, and in fact some of those, um, it's little known, are already disclosing some payment, the external chevron, through, because of the jurisdiction in Europe through the subsidiaries and so on. So it's to keep that pressure. It's very important now also the review that's going to take place of the European directives. Um, because of the years that have elapsed and in implementation and a review is therefore required and it's to provide evidence driven and we're working on that and any colleagues working on this to provide and submit the evidence as to the importance of this disclosure and why it's making a difference. That's why the resourceproject.org, that's why encouraging everybody to do analysis and to show it out there because it's just is so, so important. Tatiana, um, unfortunately I don't think he, he, he's here, Andrew Gowers, who is the uh, the head um, of an absolutely key unit in, in Trafigura, and he was in the earlier, er, earlier session. He would be the best to answer. But sometimes individuals can make a, a big difference. It makes a big difference also who is in the leadership and so on. And let's face it, crisis also matters. There are moments where they say crisis is a major challenge. Trafigura, like many other companies and many countries, had their major challenge in, in Sierra Leone with a, with a scandal and that uh, by the reformers and the newcomers that was used as, as an opportunity for reform. And that we find, and you know as a researcher, at the country level as well. So those are opportunities. And of course those are opportunities that are also seized on from the accountability side by civil society groups and NGOs and organizations like ours that then engage with those companies. We are getting calls nowadays from other companies that have had their share of scandals. Okay, 
what can we do? And can you help us with advice and so on? So those are opportunities to be seized. If it's business as usual and the company sees that they're making the profits and they, they remain like the good old days, quite opaque, it's one thing. But when something uh, um, hits, that is a real opportunity. We can discuss that much more, but uh, that's uh, in, in, in part. Rahul, what's your name, right? Rahul, on the uh, excellent question on these other initiatives, um, which are very important, the BEPS, uh, uh, the Financial As uh, Action Task Force, and, and related ones. One difference between those initiatives, which are very important, and the EITIs of this world, is the EITI uh, was in that sense in, in a fantastic innovation. Of course, I'm biased because I'm in it, but it was a fantastic innovation in terms of being of the new set of multi-stakeholder initiatives, where essentially the notion is that if you get together, even if there are different interests, but to try to align incentives and converge to compromises, government, industry, and civil society, and of course that also involves uh, parliamentarians and others and so on, um, then you, you can go further. These other initiatives are very important, but they're very governmental. They're multi-governmental and across government, and exchange of information across government is very important. But one very interesting distinction, which I attribute in part as a result of one being just one stakeholder across the jurisdiction versus multi-stakeholder initiative, is that they don't give sufficient importance to transparency. So they have all these exchanges of information, but it stays among themselves. And so the, in the next stage, I think this is really important what they're doing and the BEPs and so on, but how to pry that open? You know, among government, there's always a little bit of more reticence of, of that for you know, why should this be public? We see this debate very much being played out about beneficial ownership registries and when, depending on who also, takes the lead and so on. When is it not just let's have a registry, but we, we will stay within the judiciary and only limited access to that. But we in the government will know so trust us. That's one model. And the other is no, let's make it all public and you get 20 million auditors. In other words, the citizens, right? So, um, so that's, uh, that's, that's that. Now, regarding the other aspect of your question of those are multi governmental, multi-country versus national level. I'll give you, of course, it's an easy answer. Both are absolutely crucial. At the end of the day, if they're very important, multilateral uh, and international initiatives, but there's a lack of resolve and leadership and follow up and, 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 and work at the national level, very little uh, will happen. It, the leadership, at, at the national level and the action at the national level is very crucial. And that's one thing that was understood early on in initiatives like EITI. He, exactly in the situation of the initiative with more than 50 countries has 50 national-based initiatives. That's where most of the important action is taking place, not in Oslo. I mean, we meet in the board and we set certain government policy, but in terms of the real work is on the ground. And in terms of our work as NRGI, <coughs> most of our resources don't go into what happens in Oslo, which is very important still, but it's <coughs> working with the countries at the national level. And there's no more potent in this area, in this field of natural resources, example that you need the national level than an initiative like that, where from early on was realized if it just stays as a group on a board setting policies at the global level, but without the, the total commitment and complementarity and work with the infrastructure of a secretariat of multi-stakeholder stakeholder groups and all that created at the national level, nothing would happen. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the informative talk. Um, I had two questions. One was regarding uh, what you just mentioned, actually, about it being a national level uh, leadership thing. Um, I was just wondering if, if it also makes sense that in, in, in your research, did you also find that um, was, there was not just continent level variation, but also within country variation in terms of how resources were, were being governed? 
uh, when it come to when it came to a subnational level and do you see that as a challenge uh, not just at a national level but but going below and and seeing if there's um, within country variation and you have to 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 change how you deal with the situation depending on the context um, secondly i was just wondering what is your opinion regarding um, the movement to shift away from national resources altogether as far as energy requirements go and the fact that a lot of the uh, a lot of the countries that you showed were developing countries which relied on on oil and gas for their energy requirements um, how do you view the, the whole clean energy movement in the context of deterring corruption Hey, thank you, Frederick Schneider from the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. I mean, commodity trading is a very mobile activity. We know that traders can switch their activities to one hub to the other very easily. It's as well very competitive. We know, for example, in Geneva, there are delegation coming from Singapore to ask commodity traders what kind of framework they would want, what kind of legislation to operate they would prefer. And if I read your recommendation properly, I mean, you advise to the Swiss trading hub to put a legislation for transparency of payments by commodity traders. Uh, in this context, what makes you believe that if we would do this, other trading hubs would follow? Raymond Sanner from the Center for Socioeconomic Development. Um, may I ask you initially uh, uh, just a simple question? Uh, what do you, how do you define corruption? Uh, you know, there's, to my knowledge, there's all kinds of corruption. What goes into your own assessment and data? For instance, there could be um, state capture, right? such as it is being described in newspapers in South Africa, but it could have also been a coup d'etat, such as in your own country, uh, where laws are changed. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, foreign uh, transnational companies in the copper field don't pay taxes in Chile. Now, is this corruption, even though by law, there's no under-the-table payments. So I'd like to know a bit more and to better understand what you mean, what you include in, in the uh, uh, index. So that could be also useful for us when we discuss similar things here in Geneva. Thank you. I thought the question will get easier. <laughs> Let me, okay. Um, first, thank you for these. These are important insights, and I guess it's a lot of food for thought for us to 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 continue this conversation. Uh, just a few things from your your question. It's extremely important. Um, there are many countries, particularly larger countries, and where uh, mining also is very prevalent, given. <clears throat> the locational issues, the subnational aspects are absolutely critical. And that's one of the reasons as a part of the, the improvement and ex extension of EITI standard into the new one, which is a 2016 standard. The whole issue of, of uh, the whole component for subnational and transfer payments and what are the modalities is, is very, very important. But it is still a very challenging area. It's Typically, the focus of so much of this work is in the capital of the, of the country and perhaps in the main city, while so much of the real action is happening on the resource extractive uh, areas. And we have, frankly, and that goes to your previous question, it's totally unrealistic that outside 
organizations that come from the outside, however much we pride ourselves in terms of our technical assistance, or even the world banks of this world, which I know well because I used to be there, they cannot expect themselves to come in and help at, at that. And that's where one has to create thousands of points of light and through training and others with our focus on saying, look, it has to also happen at the subnational level and, and through the national implementation, national level implementation of EITI and other forms, it has, it has to happen. Um, we contribute to that, having done a lot of work about what are the, the lessons learned in terms of good revenue sharing, sharing mechanisms versus ones that are not uh, the most appropriate in terms of how you share revenues between the localities that are producing the center and the other localities that were not fortunate enough to be rich in resources. There are a number of very significant challenges. The other, which is a, a key aspect of the index, and you can look at also, is local contact, content issues. In fact, one of the key findings of the RGI that I did not mention because of time is that the magnitude of the pending challenge in terms of implementation we discuss, and in general in terms of performance, it's even larger in, at the subnational level. So the subnational issues, and that includes, and that goes to your other question, environmental issues, which we do include in, in the index. That, those are huge, and there is a major gap. So because of pressures, a variety of, um, of uh, various sites, including from the center and so on, there are more environmental assessments and the studies are done and some uh, policies are adopted in writing, but they're not being in implemented. So there we have major challenges uh, ahead. We did not go through that, but we use as an intellectual, analytical, and organizing framework for all the work that we do, the Natural Resource Charter, which is all, also available in, in, the, in the web, that basically follows the whole uh, value and decision-making chain, uh, starting from the first important decision that every country has to make, which is to extract or not, and nowadays, um, given the importance of climate change and environmental challenge, that, that question rises even more to the fore and it's very important. If the answer is, well, yes, it may make sense nowadays to the environmental aspect, the cost, environmental cost has to be put totally into analysis and what kind of mitigation is put there. But one has to start from asking those very fundamental co questions from the very very source at the at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> let me go back, let me go uh, straight to corruption because then on commodity trading, which is very important, I want to say just a few words and invite uh, Joe and or Alex, who have been part of the study, and my colleagues to also make a few comments because this is just so important. So, on corruption. Uh, again, that's an issue, my friend. We can be here until midnight, and of course, there's a whole uh, literature. The standard definition is the abuse of public office for private gain uh, because of the work I've done in the, in the past on capture and so on. I, I don't think that does full justice to also the importance of looking at some aspects of corruption that may be legal according to the laws of the country at that moment that may not be fair. And you gave an example during the Pinochet era decades ago in, in, in Chile, which by the way now have, there are royalty payments and many others that, that are paid. So it's, it's an open question regarding whether Chile is getting a fair deal from international companies or not, but that's very fair. But just to clarify in terms of uh, the resource governance index, our index are you using, the, all the questions and the data regarding the first two components, which is value realization and revenue management that I showed earlier, they basically do not touch on the issue of, of uh, corruption dir directly but it's indirectly so measuring the issues of transparency, measuring issues of governance in that, in that context. 
the enabling environment then for the country as a whole then draws on external indicators on, on corruption. And that includes a corruption control indicator from the worldwide governance indicator, which I started in a different life, for which we essentially use all the data sources that exist around the world on that. So it's a variety from, from including from the World Economic Forum, a, <clears throat> A survey of enterprises, number of others, IMD here in Geneva, many surveys uh, of enterprises, surveys of, of, uh, um, of some public officials, but also very importantly citizens and then many of the expert agencies. We're talking about over 20 different such sources that I, I use for that, with that, and it's fully there, it comes again. There's a margin of imprecision of that, so one has to use it for uh, care. But basically, we do not uh, put our own assessment and say this country has that corruption or not, but we use thousands and thousands of data points from all these surveys, the results that nowadays are pretty common from, uh, from around the world. Um, to, and then on your co commodity trading, um, um, legislation. Let me just say one thing, and I'll pass it uh, to Joe. Say a few words, or Alex, if 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 you uh, want. There is obviously when a country takes a lead, and this happened in the U.S. at first, with, because of Luger, Senators Luger, and and and, and Ben Cardin, and then and Dot Frank. They took the lead, and they took a leap, in fact, regarding this payment to government uh, transparency. And there was exactly the same question from many, uh, particularly in industry, uh, this is unfair, how do, you, do we know that anybody else will fail, will be an unfair competitive advantage and so on. The argument was we are the world leaders on, on this, we need to set the stage. EU followed, and now they have leapfrogged over the United States because the United States have gone backwards. My frank um, sense is that the same applies today on commodity trading for Switzerland. If Switzerland is the most important commodity trading hub in the world, if Switzerland takes the lead, I see it's going to be very difficult for the UK not to follow. And then uh, someday there will be political changes in the United States and so on. They will have to and they will want to follow. Um, and even the Singapore's of this world and, and, and so on. So it's a question at, at some point of, okay, at what point we exert and exercise leadership because we are the ones, we are the leaders in the world in terms of this particular issue. And that's what, uh, what happened there. But of course, not I nor anybody else can guarantee that. But maybe you can offer some granularity, also some of the highlight <laughs> of the results that show how important this issue is. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. I think um, Danny's points around someone needs to go first is, is really critical here. And the analogy with, with Dodd-Frank in 2010, it was one country, the biggest market in relation to this sector, which decided to go first, and other countries followed. So, at least from my perspective, if Switzerland was to legislate in this area, it's inconceivable for me that the second largest trading hub in the world, the United Kingdom, um, would not. And Switzerland can take a lot of comfort because the UK has already committed to enhance disclosure, company disclosure in this area. If the UK looks at Switzerland and, the Switzer and, uh, and things have moved on, then it's going to say, perfect, that is the framework uh, we will follow. The European Commission, which um, makes initiatives in this area, it has committed to do the same thing. So Switzerland going forward through the process and making the commitment next month is, um, is not jumping out in, in, in the dark. There is a number of com uh, countries, the Netherlands, uh, Italy, European Commission, uh, and the UK, which have already said they want to move in this area. Specifically on the UK, in December, 
the United Kingdom specifically said that it was examining its own rules to see if commodity trading could be included. And we can share you the, the statement from the, from the UK government. So there's n not a huge amount to worry about, I would say, if Switzerland was to move um, in, this, uh, in, in this area. It simply comes down to what is the responsibility of the largest player. And I think that's, that, that, that's the simplest way I can, I can put it. Just to elaborate slightly on, on Danny's point, um, not only have others followed suit in, in, in the US, in seven years since these extractive payments to governments laws were, were passed, I have never seen one company decide to move jurisdiction because of these regulations, not one. And yes, we heard Shell and BP say, oh, it's commercially confidential for us to do this. We're going to lose uh, competitiveness. They were, they, were, they were really worried about these issues. But suddenly you fast forward five years and they're reporting, they're exactly in the same place and their share price is doing just fine. Uh, since this is uh, uh, a hot potato, uh, and you mentioned uh, several times uh, an elephant in the room, but at least a hot potato presently, before we come to a close, because time is, is running and is getting short, on this topic, would anyone else would like to jump in with uh, comments or, or, or questions on, on this very topic? We have here someone and, and there, so maybe we take the two and then we wrap up. I'm Werner Tools from Swiss Development Corporation and I would like to build on the question of my colleague uh, uh, Frédéric Schöne and on your answers regarding uh, what individual countries could do and whether Switzerland should be afraid or not of, of companies moving their jurisdiction. And, and my question would be, we have talked now a little bit about countries at the country level and country decisions, uh, decisions at the country level, what could uh, the role of uh, international organizations potentially be to promote a, a, a level playing field, ensuring a standard, a global reporting standard in commodity trading. Uh, I refer to the, to the 2016 conclusions of the, of the anti-corruption summit in London where there was a statement of, of, an, of a number of countries we, we, where, where it was said, yes, now we should do something about, in a, in a collective manner, and eventually, as I understand properly, the, the, the baby has been handed over to the OECD. And now in a number of, in a couple of weeks, there will be a discussion in the OECD context whether what the OECD could do in an intergovernmental perspective to promote a, a global common reporting standard, avoiding exactly and facing and, and doing something against these this, this fears, which has been very rightfully mentioned by, by, Francois, uh, by Frédéric Schöne. That would be my question. Thanks. Uh, my name is Ilya Marisoinen. I'm from the uh, Partnership Against Corruption Initiative, actually at the World Economic Forum. Uh, it's the, the second, lar second uh, longest initiative of the forum, uh, actually after the Global Competitive Index. Uh, um, so the question would be just a simple one. Uh, you know, hypothetically, say we have 30, 40 CEOs in a room next week. Uh, what uh, what would be your two two messages for them in terms of? of how to, to action things in the short term and, uh, and longer term commitments, especially in terms of engaging with government um, you know, in, in difficult places. <laughs> okay, in, in, in brief. So, um, Werner, um, very good uh, point. The, um, this, some of these global initiatives and global organizations are very important. Of course, uh, we will keep on, on this within uh, EITI, and uh, there's already discussion in, within EITI about the next stage of ramping up what are the requirements or the expectations, at least, vis-a-vis -vis what companies need to do. Um, EITI because in part um, there was this <coughs> comfort that all these laws were being adopted mandating companies what to do starting with Dodd Frank um, was quite has been quite focused on what governments need to do 
But the time has come also for these initiatives to be much more explicit of what industry should, should be doing, particularly since they're full, a full stakeholder of that. And we, from think tanks and civil society, also need to behave well and so on. So I think this is a mutual commitment that all the three stakeholders should do. So EITI, obviously, is one such forum. You mentioned, and rightly so, and you know them very well, OECD. You and others and my colleagues are working very closely on OECD. has a very important initiative and task force on that. You're going to meet at the end of January. So um, that is a very important multilateral con context to continue this discussion. What Joe Williams was just mentioning about, and he, he resides and focuses so much on the UK, and London knows everything about that, or what's happening in the, in the UK. The OECD is an incredibly important fora for both sides in that, that context. So that interface is very important. One that has not been mentioned, and I'll put it right up front there, is a newcomer, quote unquote, or a return camera, I would call it. I have gray hair, so there was a time they paid a lot of attention, and now they're paying attention again to this governance, corruption, and transparency issues, and that's IMF. The International Monetary Fund has come to the conclusion that these issues, including corruption, and these issues are what they term macro-critical. Okay, so they matter. And what better example of what happened in, in Brazil and Latin America, Petrobras and Odebrecht and, and, and so on. So this is not just purely small sectoral issues and so on. We are talking about billions and billions of dollars that have macro implications. And the IMF has also a very important role to play in, in, that, in that context and uh, in ensuring that there is a forum um, and incentives for all, all countries to join that and align uh, itself. So there are uh, some, and there are obviously others. There are also the regional bodies are very important. Uh, um, the, obviously the regional development banks, the, the UN and UN agencies, in particular on the economic side, the ECLAC, and the, uh, <coughs> the basically the uh, ECA, Economic Commission for Africa, and and uh, and, and so so on. Um, Pachi, what what economic uh, f uh, forum? That's a, a a great great question. I think in taking off from what uh, Joe was saying before, having them first to have a, a very frank discussion about the new world and new realities regarding transparency and disclosure, I'm taking it as, as almost a case study, even if they're not all in the, in the extractive sector, because there have been such focus and, and so on. And if, if you have some of those in, in the room, ALA, Shell, and BP, just to be able to say, well, how has this experience of being transparent and disclosure worked out? And this being shared among the, the different uh, CEOs. We just last night heard a, a great statement uh, from somebody about their own CEO, which all of a sudden realized that they were getting kudos for being transparent and became much more interested in that. Sometimes the CEOs doesn't know that it's in the next level that some of these decisions happen, EITI, okay, then let's disclose this and that. And then they start seeing the press, and we help with that, that they're getting good press. So, this year's good. so just much more we're discussing here, you know it, we know it, but uh, many of the CEOs, you know, the day to day and whether they they are not fully aware. So, just getting that discussion um, happening, and then obviously the two fronts that we have discussed now are absolutely two key me messages on the on on to to industry is one the. Um, a reinforced commitment in the next stage of the European directives that this is working, this is fine, and that's basically the new 21st century transparency era, and we're committed to that, continue, which would be also a message for the US counterparts. Uh, uh, some 
of the non-US companies, although they may not be fully admitted in public, they are losing patience with the Exxons and the, the Chevrons of taking that, that stance. They don't necessarily want to fully publicly break ranks, but they realize that they are in a different era and they want to move forward. So just for them to say, look, we are in this game, we believe in that, and we're going to support the European Union directive, the Canadian and all the others going that from one. And the other is what we just discussed. If there was a front discussion, and it is, Davos is right around the corner, it is Switzerland, and said, look, maybe it's time for also addressing the area that has been most opaque so far, and that's commodity trading. We have to just discuss that. There is this new data and the report that, uh, that we have. Switzerland has a unique opportunity that will, will come 10 days after Davos or so on, and discussion in Parliament if some of these companies, and we know that, that uh, some are already voluntarily disclosing, and say, look, at the end of the day, this is a new era, at least it's not that bad, or there is no, no resistance from us, maybe that's the time to go forward. That could be very important as well. Well, I think, uh, thank you very much. Uh, time is uh, coming to a close. So I would like first to, to really commend the NRGI, you, Danny, uh, Joe, Alex, uh, for coming all the way today from the US to share with us uh, what you, all the work that you have invested and the findings that you have now with the Resource Governance Index and also cutting-edge research that you have shared with uh, documents here. Thank you very much. This is most inspiring and very substant substantive for uh, development overall. Second, I'd like to, to thank also uh, Tatiana von Steiger and the SDC uh, for making this possible, co-organizing this event with us. And I'd like to thank also all my colleagues who have worked behind the scene to prepare for, for, for the event. And, and thirdly, I'd like to highlight how important, I think, uh, and inspirational your work, uh, Danny, personally is because you have been investing all your life in. Uh, you have been investing so much into research, into generating primary data that is really informing policy debates, and uh, you have uh, gone out of uh, many comfort zones, but also out of the ivory tower to really engage as a as a, as a citizen on critical issue for international development and, and global governance. So I'd like to conclude uh, with, a, with a big applause and thank you very much again. Thank you to you, thank you Tatiana and to the collaboration. And just to say that none of my work would have been possible in every case. And if you go to, to my website of all the papers and research, it's always with partners, with co-authors and so on. So that's why it was so important, the invitation also, and I have my colleagues here in, the, in this case, there are many others, and many that are, are here. If it wasn't for the collaboration and the partnership with so many people and organizations, so it's, it's don't make it too personal because I, I get concerned. <laughs> Thank you.